In 2009, just four miles from here, the Staffordshire Hoard was discovered. It's an astonishing thing. Over 3,500 Anglo-Saxon artefacts. They're radically historically important and exquisitely beautiful, of course, too. They're jointly housed and jointly owned by Stoke-on-Trent and Birmingham City Museum and Art Galleries. I think that's exactly right, because the place straddles the line for me between the West Midlands and Old Staffordshire, the Potteries. I am West Midlands born and bred and I live now in Staffordshire and there are elements of both in Lichfield I think. The accent is distinctly more my neck of the woods but all of the localities that bleed into it and constitute it are more distinctly Old Staffordshire and I think that gives it a flavour of both my former and my current existence as I see the three spires protruding from the countryside as I travel along the A38. I feel a sense of homecoming in both senses to my real and adopted home. I came up here looking for a grand vista across the city that I remember seeing in 1993. It's nearly as I remember it, but not quite. It's changed a bit. But haven't we all? Beware the distorting mirrors. garden formerly belonging to Dr Erasmus Darwin, grandfather of the Charles that we know from the voyages of Charles Darwin. It's a lovely place. The shadows of the trees and the shrubs and the herbs themselves falling long and languid on this August afternoon. It's one of the buildings off the Cathedral Close. The Cathedral Close in Lichfield is one of the most complete and lovely in England. I've never checked, it'd be very easy for me to do so, what the derivation, the etymological derivation of the word close is in its ecclesiastical sense, whether it's to do with it as a preposition and an adverb of place, or an adjective denoting closed and closed off, or maybe it has nothing to do with any of those things, but that's how it feels, and uh, they do a lot of favours for a building and for a place, these little closes. Litchfield is not an enormous um, conurbation but neither is it a, a small French cathedral town with the cathedral looming behind a single street bar, tabac, boulangerie, charcuterie. Um, it's maintained in these days of social distancing, it's, it's maintained its distance from the rest of the town, it's, its seclusion and its little pool of quiet between those two pools Minster Pool and Stoke Pools, those real pools, it's a metaphorical pool of quiet and you can hear it and sense it here, the sun on your face, the blurred traffic noise in the background, a couple of children's voices like ripples in a swimming pool. Litchfield is alone amongst English cathedral cities and in fact amongst places full stop as being somewhere where I once spent the night in an ice cream van back on a snowy March evening in 1993. There can't be many people who spent the night in an ice cream van, wouldn't have thought. Even ice cream men and ladies, ice cream sellers, unless they're having marital difficulties. I wasn't having marital difficulties at the time, I just spent the night in an ice cream van. Perhaps the KLF have done it. It's justified and he's ancient. 
and he spends the night in an ice cream van. Perhaps if they'd called Tammy up in Tennessee, she wouldn't have been so keen on that lyrical content. Who knows? My granddad had an ice cream van. Did he? Apparently, just not long after the war, apparently. I have no idea. I've got a picture of my dad sitting, my dad being about two or three years old, sitting on the, the kind of counter of it. It's no good sitting on the counter of it. You've got to spend the night on it. Yeah, what a place. It's just uh, it's a source of great pride, um, I think it should be for us, that whole idea of the, the Midlands Enlightenment, places like this being the city of philosophers, uh, people like David Garrick, Hannah Seward, um, Samuel Johnson, Erasmus Darwin himself, treading the streets around here, and even though they might not have been resident, there would have been an awful lot of um, interaction with people like Watt and Bolton and other members of the Loon Society, and I just think... Um, I think they did, yeah. in here, I think they did, um, they did have regular meetings at this house, yeah, I think, if yeah. I recall correctly. Um, along with Soho House in Birmingham. <coughs> I think there were, there were various Birmingham locations yeah. that, they, that they went to. On the full moon. Yeah, of course, the London Society, yeah. yeah. Darwin himself, I mean, what a Renaissance man he was. He was essentially a doctor, a physician yeah. here. Um, but his list of inventions and achievements is amazing. He's almost like a kind of Leonardo da Vinci character. Yeah, he was. He was massively ahead of his time. And yeah, his social conscience was very advanced for the time. You know, he's an abolitionist, as, as they all were. And yeah, absolutely. But I was incredible. fascinated by the fact that he. He, I don't know whether he literally invented it, but he certainly evolved it to a massive degree. Um, suspension systems in carriages, and the steering and suspension systems, because everyone carried it, travelled everywhere by, by carriage. He was going obviously to Birmingham yeah. and all over there. He was going all over the place. He was going over to to um, to Staffordshire to see Wedgwood yeah. um, constantly. Um, and the, the, the quality of travel in terms of comfort was awful. And you just thought, right, well, let's, let's work out how we cushion this experience of travelling on horrendously potholed and horrible roads. So he invented the suspension systems and kept doing it, he kept evolving it. You know what the great difference between me and Josiah Wedgwood is? I, not off the top of my head. He was allowed to keep his hip after he had it removed. And he used That's to. Right. Yeah, he used to keep it, because I asked them, they wouldn't let me keep it. Um, but uh, he used to celebrate it every year on hip day. That's correct, I'd forgotten all about that, yeah. Yeah, amazing, amazing stuff. Um, but yeah, he also invented uh, some sort of printing machinery, I think, didn't he? Uh, he he kind of helped with that and uh, was thinking about ways to record the voice and so on. Um, way ahead of his time, yeah. What couldn't they do? stone slightly dirtied it's not anything that could inhabit the south or the far north it's only a little cathedral it's uh, a lot smaller than it appears um, it's more reminiscent of one of the smaller French cathedrals the cathedrals of northern France somewhere like Sez or Coutance springs to mind and it was the only one um, it is the only one with all of its three spires intact. Uh, I think one of them was shot off, I think the central spire was shot off in the English Civil War but has been rebuilt. Quite a few of them. Lincoln would have been twice the height it is towering on that hill now with its three spires and it's quite a thing to imagine them but it retains its and that particular silhouette it's, it's just itself and nothing else. Lovely ribbed vault 
dotted, pillared, columned and traceried space. I think it cants over a little to one side, I think to do with the uh, weight of the stone of the ceiling and or the base of the columns, the height of the columns, I'm not quite sure. It's not the worst for that though, is it? Sleeping Children by Francis Chantry is a heck of a thing to behold. Memories of the Boothby Monument in St Oswald in Ashbourne, which I think was partially the inspiration for it, although inspiration sounds, uh, sounds odd when you know the story. Um, I think um, Ellen Jane Robinson, yeah, the mother, had the same name as the, the first daughter, lost her entire family in three years. Um, her husband, who was uh, a local clergyman, um, died of tuberculosis, and then the older um, daughter, who was named after her, um, died in a horrific incident in which her nightdress caught fire in Bath, um, and then the younger daughter, Marianne, died a year later of some unspecified sickness. As I say, the, the Boothby Memorial springs to mind, and that horrible line, the wreck was total moving stuff. Such a deep West Midlands saint, Saint Chad. His story and the story of his relics and the destruction of his shrine, etc. has little glimmers of Sedgley and Kidderminster and so many places from my own childhood, not making any comparisons, of course. The lovely little Capolad Free Library and Museum used to be the Art Gallery and Museum. That I always walk past just before I get the bus back home. It's a shame it still isn't the Art Gallery and Museum. Apart from being a lovely building, it seems to sit in exactly the right spot for its purpose. Who knows? Maybe it will be again. I came and sat here back in 2014 and savoured the moment that we broke up for the summer holidays. I always like to do that, to mark the passage as you teeter on the edge of that great sunlit chasm of time. Uh, it's a little bit different this year, what with Covid and uh, lockdown etc. But all things being well, I've only got a couple more summer holidays to go before I swim into that great uncharted water of my own free time. I grow old, I grow old, shall I wear my trousers rolled? As T.S. Eliot said, I'm not wearing my trousers rolled, it's, I've got too many sort of mid-80s connotations, bros and people like that who brought turnips back, I'll be wearing waxed Dr. Martins next, nasty business. You do realise you made it sound as though you're almost 60 there. Um, yeah, I suppose I did. Yeah, but that's probably quite believable for most of the, the viewing public. Again, I'm overestimating the size of the viewing public by calling them that, aren't I? He's 52, for the record. Whoa! <laughs> Poor ill-fated Edward Smith, captain of the HMS Titanic, of course. He's been portrayed by quite a few luminaries, a veritable pantheon of respected actors. Um, Lawrence Naismith, Brian Ahern, 
um, George C. Scott, Michael Rennie, Bernard Hill of course, to name but a few. I wonder who's next? My money's on Ewan McGregor in the next uh, adaptation. Um, I'm not leaving it, it's my ship, that kind of thing. I'm already working on the screenplay. and healed the sick, with no more idea that this would exist so far into the future in his honour than had poor Captain Smith that he'd be portrayed by Yozza Hughes. distinctive chimneys of the hospital of St John the Baptist without the walls. Without, of course, meaning outside. It provided accommodation for travellers who arrived in the city after it had shut its gates. A beautiful and evocative idea in the first place. Beautiful it is and incongruous by the side of the busy road adjacent to Lidgefield City train station here. Looking like it's just travelled through time. Which, of course, it has. slightly annoys me the way that, that, that the Loon Society aren't quite as, as prominent in, in the popular consciousness of, of this country as they should be, you know. Well, I mean, they're from the West Midlands, isn't it? Well, I, I don't, like, you know, we don't want to get too, too, too much of a chip on our shoulder no. about that or, or whatever, but no. we but we, we both think the same about yeah. it, don't we, really? It is a place that, that kind of is... Uh, um, overlooked and underrated. Overlooked yeah. and, and overlooks itself in many ways yeah, as well. It doesn't yeah. it doesn't show from the rooftops. But um, which is part of his charm? Absolutely, but definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, there's a humility in the dry humour, yeah. uh, for instance. But anyway, back, back yeah. to the back to the Lunar Society. Um, yeah, it, it sort of annoys me a little bit that, and you know, people often think about the, the Industrial Revolution. I think people associate it with the kind of 1800s and, and sort of perhaps a bit later in the 1800s, but actually the groundwork that was laid in the late 1700s yeah. in no small part by the Lunar Society, obviously there were many others, yeah. um, is it, something that, that people aren't immediately aware of at a time of incredible um, evolution of consciousness, yeah. really. Yeah, they were, and, they, and they were all over that. They were mapping the, the, um, the, the, you know, the perceptual limits of the, of the the known world, weren't they, at that point? Yeah. Uh, enormously. Yeah. Um, and people think about sort of the, not that I know very much about it, but the leading lights of the, the French Revolution yeah. and so on, the, the French Enlightenment. Um, but but the Lewis Society were in co constant close contact with those guys. Um, and 
laid a lot of the groundwork for a lot of the discoveries that were made. I know that they were instrumental in quite a lot of the discoveries of the composition of air yeah. and the atmosphere. And although they're not yeah. credited with, with, with kind of the, the discoveries, they, they really did help with a lot of the groundwork of that. It's often the case, like things like the Daguerreoscope, you know, leading to you know photography, but you know, obviously Louis Daguerre gets no coverage, mm. and, and there always has yeah. to be a huge machine, Daguerre doesn't there? You know, of catalyst catalysts and sort of catalytic forces. But they, but they would have been here talking about yeah. those things. They would have been here thinking, hold on a minute, there is something that we cannot see in the atmosphere yeah. that, that, that is instrumental.